Thank you very much uh, for your kind words and certainly uh, I'm pleased to be here and the problem is we talk so much about the world of all plaques and it leads to the almost the rapture of the brain sometimes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and I said, what can we talk about it? So what I'm going to approach is a model which is diabetes with the context of atherosclerotic disease because I think it's a very hot subject. It's worthwhile to talk about it. So diabetes and atherosclerotic thrombosis are being put into the vascular. This is what we are talking about. And I'd just like to start with the metabolic syndrome, the World Health Organization definition, where you have at least one of these three, diabetes, hyperglucose tolerance, or insulin resistance, and at least two on the right side, hypertension, obesity, hyperthyroidism, or low HDL, and microbiome. What this means is that very recently, the basis of the metabolic syndrome are being unraveled, and I just want to make a summary very short which appear to be genetic factors that may lead to a key cell, the adipocyte, because people tend to be obese, and these cells release the cytokines that actually go to the liver, and also cytokines from other cells that go to the liver, macrophages, and then what the liver does, it leads to new molecules that actually generate vasoconstriction that raises the blood pressure, triglycerides, low HDL, and insulin resistance, and it's all on molecular basis. So here you have a risk factor profile that evolved from molecules related to the syndrome, adipocyte particularly, and at the same time, the, at the same time, the cytokines really were directed to the vessel wall. So it's a time bomb to have the metabolic syndrome because you have the whole risk factor profile plus the cytokines. And I'm now beginning to understand why in countries and where there is a lot of liver disease, those particular individuals may be protected from coronary artery disease. And I wonder that the liver is incapable to actually synthesize and release the substances I'm talking about. I think this is a very important issue and very hot at the present time. Now, let me get into diabetes and the field is getting very exciting at this time. With the very onset of the disease, we can say that there is endothelial damage caused by hyperglycemia, but this is almost saying nothing. What is evolving at the present time from many lines of investigation is the following, and this is very exciting, and that is hyperglycemia gets into the endothelium, and this whole process is activated, which is the liberation of energy through these metabolites. And it actually tends to occur in the mitochondria, but there is too much energy that is not needed. So the energy now moves into oxidation. And the oxidation products, excuse me, Jim, I'm putting the laser in your head. <laughs> you go a little bit backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, sorry for that. Uh, and then the oxidized products can actually damage the endothelium. But this is not enough. There is now molecules called PARP. They block this enzyme. This enzyme is an enzyme of exit time to really get all these uh, products of energy out. And then time is blocked, and now you have a really a situation that is a vice cycle of energy that is not used, oxidation, and you block the enzyme that is, uh, is, is should be a defense mechanism. And the key of all of this is maybe the whole process of diabetes and endothelial damage may be reversed, and these pharmacological tools now being developed, blocking this enzyme in allowing for this process to go on. This is all very exciting, and I just wanted to present to you in a synthesized fashion. Now, the issue of the second phase of the disease in terms of diabetes is very striking, and I have to recognize here Dr. Pedro Moreno. Very basically, this is the plaque with a high content of fat, and I want you to pay attention to the vasodilator. The vasodilator will probably have a key role as a defense mechanism going into the where the fat is and taking the fat out through this small vessel by a gradient of concentration. Let's see what we found. First of all, we have here MRI showing, as Claude mentioned, that the plug draws eccentrically. And then we work on three animal models, and I'm not presenting you the data, it was just published in the last year or two, 
quite bad one, where we saw that in the animal model, indeed, the plaque grows eccentrically. It seems that by MRI, there's something wrong with the media and the adventitia. And that's where Pedro Moreno comes in. An autopsy study, looking specifically what happens to the media and the adventitia once you have the position of fat in the intima. And what you see is something described in the 1980s in the literature that was forgotten. Vasopasol, and in patients with diabetes, significant number of macrophages in red. What is interesting here, let me go back before I show them. What is interesting here is this predominates in the diabetic patients, the macrophage component. And the reason is the following. This is a microangiopathy. That is, the vessels get into the vessel wall in the diabetic population, but they leave red cells. And the red cells probably act as foreign bodies. Call the monocyte, and the monocyte phagocytite the red cells, but now you have a time bomb. And that is, uh, the vessels are entering into the intima with activated monocytes releasing metalloproteinases that may actually rupture the internal elastic lamina, which appears to be critical in maintaining the architecture of the vessel wall. Now what I'm going to show you is very exciting. This new imaging technology showing you this in vivo, in humans, the vasodilator, by injecting microbubbles, work done in collaboration here with the group Feinstein in Chicago, which are now we are working together. This is a carotid artery, and, and, uh, and let's wait for a moment to zoom in. You will see in black is the plaque, and these are the microbubbles. And now you are going to see, after injecting the periphery, how the vasodilator are here, and how the bubbles get into where the plaque is. We now have lots of pictures like this. This is in the carotid system. And it's absolutely fantastic because really what it's telling you that the vasovasorum -vaso is not something innocuous. It's probably a defense mechanism which has a lot to do with the disease as we will talk in a moment. Um, so what actually was found is that this conglomerate of vasovasorum -vaso microphages may rupture the internal elastic lamina and this precedes the rupture of the plaque. This is just by reconstructing the natural history of the atherosclerotic <coughs> process in 400 plaques obtained at autopsy and going through the classification of the American Heart Association. And what it appears is that the number of vasodilators in the rupture of internal elastic lamina precede plaque rupture and are probably the two most important factors leading to the rupture of the plaque. And here you have the thin fibrous scar in the content of lipid. I think this is a very important, and it tells us again how one cannot be dogmatic. Why the vasodilator were forgotten is because after seeing the lumen with thrombus, everybody concentrated on the thrombus and the intima and plaque rupture, without realizing that there is a lot going on in the median adventitia. This is described already two decades ago. What is now fascinating is through imaging technology, you are able to see all of this reconstruct the natural history. And it is not now unreasonable to understand why, when you give a statics, this was presented this morning actually by Dr. Corti, when you are giving a statics, this is a plaque in the aorta with fat here, after 24 months the fat tends to go away and the artery gets thinner. Why it gets thinner, this is the quantification data, I'm escaping it now, Probably it goes along with what the Mayo group described in the peak, and that is under hyperlipidemic conditions, there is vasodilator of the growth in the iliofemoral artery and in the coronary arteries, and once the uh, lipid material in the blood, the concentration drops with treatment, there is a complete regression with thinning of the artery. I'm now becoming convinced that many of the drugs that we are giving to approach vascular disease, they get there through the vasodilator. Not through, the, not through the lumen. Why? Because with MRI, you see a thick cup that is very difficult to understand how those molecules can cross that cup. And the cup persists after 24 months, after 36 months of lipid of statins. What it does not persist is the vasodilator that regress. So with the concept here with imaging is that in the diabetic population, this is very enhanced. And what is very striking is that the plaque grows eccentrically, as Glauco said, but also regresses eccentrically. If you are right there with the statins, creating a regular concentration between the plaque and the blood before this vasodilator betrayed you and ruptured internal elastic lamina and leading to plaque.
rupture, a defense mechanism that may end up in the ground. <coughs> Having said that, let me tell you the project we are involved in is very exciting. This comes from Framingham. The highest risk group at Framingham are those who have more than 20% of the events over a period of 10 years. What population in the United States has that? If you get women between age uh, 60 and 69 in yellow, this is about 8% of the population. And in men, it's a decade earlier, between age 50 and 59. And what we are now trying to approach is this high risk factor population to see if they are developing atherothrombotic disease or not. And these are the technologies being used, and I have again to recognize here two people, Dr. Tahir Fayyad, who is in the audience, who really is the one who developed the whole software for the magnetic resonance imaging, and Michael Poon working on CT. So here we have first classification, CT for classification, second MRA, looking at the systemic arteries after injection in the peripheral vein, ultrafast CT, injection in the peripheral vein, looking at the coronary arteries, and then magnetic resonance imaging, wherever we see abnormalities by these technologies. You can see calcium here very clearly, and now calcium is beginning to be, to have its place. Calcium mass to Franco. This is the group we are working on, a very high risk factor profile group, where you can see that if the calcium score is more than 80, these 20% events convert into 46%. And if the calcium score is less than 80, the number of events goes into 4.8%. So what really happens with these technologies, they add to, the, uh, uh, to what we already know from Franica, and is an addition to the process. Now comes the issue of MRA, where it is injected, it's reconstructed with the computer, you can see the peripheral circulation, where there are some abnormalities. <coughs> and then ultrafast CT, by looking at the coronary arteries with a peripheral injection. And now the question is whether you see calcium, you cannot see what is behind. Whenever you go to your airplane and you have a computer room, they tell you take it out because the computer is overshadowing what is behind. Here's the same thing. Let's enter into the artery, in this case, with virtual angioscopy, following what we learned from virtual colonoscopy, which actually was developed at our institution at Mount Sinai. And here we are not dealing with colon, we are dealing with two millimeter arteries. And now we can penetrate by subtracting the diet of the computer the artery I showed you before the most calcified. And here you enter, and this is actually the bifurcation where it's on the real end you the calcium. Significant advancement. That is the use of ultrafast CT in which you take care of systole and diastole. I'm not going to present to you all the data, but the sensitivity and specificity can be significantly improved by really uh, looking at the end of systole and every diastole. And I'm just presenting this to you, like the subtraction of calcium and the angioscopy, because these techniques are advancing so rapidly that we are going to have a handle of all these patients knowing what actually goes on by non-invasive technology. This is just ultra-fast the context I am presenting. And then finally, MRI. And Tahir Fayyad has, a has made a significant contribution, but I will tell you about a year ago, to process plaques in the aorta may, may have taken 24 hours. Today, it takes one and a half hours. And this is just expediting the processing of imaging, which is making now MRI much more friendly than it was just two years or three years ago. This is the fourth technology being used. What our goal is, a single machine by which the patient gets in and gets all the technologies I am discussing. And then you can really figure out what the problem is in looking at the burden of disease, which is extremely important, with how extensive it is and looking at the whole arterial system. So the only mention, I mentioned diabetes because it's so important on the vasa basoro and gave us a clue how this passive absorbing works and certainly critical pharmacological approach of the vessel wall with the, the issue of the studies. The problem with that is this is too much, too many macrophages by entering the intimate and the rupture of the plant. Let me talk a moment about the blood clot. 
The black cloud has evolved into a very significant change with imaging technology and with the understanding of diabetes. Here you have the same pool of fire, but now you have monocytes, probably as a defense mechanism, trying to get this excess of cholesterol out. And we are talking about the year 2000, where again, with Pedro, we found that in atherectomy specimens, in the diabetic patients, we saw the number of macrophages in the vessel wall was very significant, and also the tropogenicity. I have to tell you the following. I believe these macrophages come from the adventitia. And don't ask me at this moment that I can prove this in, in, a, in a scientific basis, but I just have a feeling that the large density of macrophages in the diabetic patient come from the traffic I was mentioning before from the outside. And let's leave it as it is, but it is a problem. These macrophages synthesize tons of tissue factor because they are dying because they come from all sides of the other. These are the macrophages, tissue factor, caspase 3, pointing out that is when the cell is struggling. This comes the issue that is very important from the point of view of imaging. Here we have a diabetic patient with loaded macrophages and oxidized LDL, and certainly the macrophages try to do the job. And the oxidized LDL in the big part receptor, taking it out, and at the same time to activate the single molecule. This is perfect, but this cell may decide to commit suicide because it cannot accomplish its role. And the question is, how can we reverse this process? that leads to metalloproteinase metallo synthesis and tissue factor synthesis by giving a hand, like we did with the studies to the vasovasorum, let's raise the HDL. And this is what we have done through four different experiments. The first experiment actually goes back to the year 1990, where in the rabbit model of the high cholesterol diet, you have all these macrophages getting into the vessel wall, and now in retrospect, we understand they are all apoptotic, releasing tissue factor, we inject it, human HDL dated to these rabbits, and we made the whole process to disappear. We got broke because HDL obtained from humans that we were injecting was very expensive and we gave up. But we came back to the process about two years ago with new technology and the world. And basically what we did was the experiments, the echo fishing lines, where they have a very low HDL, disease in the macrophage, in fact, apoptosis, we transplanted into animals that were exposing HDL in the whole process of the Russia, published in 2001. And then we did two other experiments. We stimulated PIPAR in a PIPAR algorithm, something that will be published in the next couple of weeks, in the rabbit model after hyperlipidemia has induced the same macrophage density that we saw in 1990. And in this case, what we do is stimulate PIPAR. Results? In blue, in, in, this is nine months of a high cholesterol diet, means this is in the order. Now in blue, we gave PIPAR gamma, simple study, and the combination of both, and of both and this is actually a regression. And I don't have time today with 15 minutes to give you the data, but the data, the macrophages go away, apoptosis go away, tissue factor goes away, metalloproteinases go away, the whole process is reversible with PIPAR gamma agonists. And now it's not difficult to understand that what we did in the rabbit in 1991 has now been reproduced in humans with the study just published in JAMA with intravascular ultrasound and disease in the arteries over a period of few weeks and showing regression. What I'm really telling you is that HDL is one of the most critical molecules of the test, and in my view, is the best antithrombotic because in fact, does not neutralize the clot that is active. It neutralizes the synthesis or reverses the process of apoptosis and then preventing the tissue factor to be synthesized and the clot to take place. is the ideal drug, the one that goes to the roots of the problem. Placing HDL is a great challenge to us and experimental is working and there is already some data in humans that appears to be very meaningful. And I'm just going to finish in the next three or four minutes by presenting to you the next step, which is also the diabetic patient. I presented diabetes here.
because these the, the, intimas are loaded with macrophages in the diabetic patient. So we believe that the synthesis of tissue factor is much Now here comes a blood clot that takes place in an artery in the nose, but there is no plaque rupture. These patients are money tend to be diabetics, hyperlipidemic, or cigarette smokers. So what we do is not too complicated. We get these patients, we put a cannula in the vein, we run in one chamber, the blood goes out, goes into the plaques we are describing, like the stenotic plaques without endothelium. In your, what you see, hyperlipidemia, in a State. And when you treat these three entities, less in the diabetic than in the smoker and the hyperlipidemic, pointing out that something is going on in the blood of these patients. What is going on? The clue is here. We found high levels of tissue factor activity, mimicking the, pres the presence of thrombus in these cannulas that I'm describing. The question is where tissue factor is coming from. And here's the data published by Sambola a few months ago in hyperlipidemia, cigarette smoking, and diabetes, high tissue factor treatment. Not so much in the diabetic, but it's still significant. What we think is happening is the monocytes in the blood are actually activated to an apoptotic state, maybe to 5% of the monocytes. And now you see the nuclear, this is obtained from peripheral circulation, the nuclear being distorted in an apoptotic mode with tissue factor in green by immunofluorescence being released. Why diabetes here? Because it's one of the typical risk factors that activate the clotting system in the moment, in the, in the way it's homogenicity in the chamber with high levels of tissue factor activity. How diabetes activates the monocyte in the circulation is obviously has to be looked at, but the observational aspects that I'm presenting to you they are quite distracting. And I'm just finishing also in the diabetic field with a very stenotic. Now the clock has been organized by connective tissue, maybe. And now you have this here, this clock being organized by connective tissue in the rabbit model. It takes eight weeks. And it is interesting that clinical observations tell us that during the first few weeks of a clock, another clock can come in through occlusion, after MOI bleeding a stroke in the left ventricle can be a second stroke if you don't give anticoagulants and so forth. What is actually happening? And again, the free tissue very successfully by having antibodies clots. And then these antibodies are linked to uh, iron or godalinium, and you can see the activity of a clot by using magnetic resonance imaging. And I can postulate at this time that during a period of time, the clots are active. And we believe that it is during this time that the clot is active that has not been substituted by connective tissue, also seen by MRI, that another black clot can come in. But why the next clot comes in? And now, is exciting. What I'm going to show to you, this is work by Ruth in, at, uh, uh, in Cambridge, in England, who's joining us. And basically, it's using ultra-fast CT to look at the carotid artery in humans in post emission tomography to see what happens with the monocytes at the site of a clot, and it gets hot. So basically, probably the clot that remains is, is a clot that, as a foreign body, attracts monocytes. And the monocytes, once they get exhausted, the release tissue factor in that clot is hyperactive. And all of this you can see by imaging technology within the first few weeks of a clot that remains there, just to give you the sense of the importance of imaging technology. And what I'm going to tell you now, I'm building up because I don't have any data. I would suggest, or I would think, that in the patient, that it's a pro-inflammatory process, the number of macrophages getting into the remaining blood is much larger than normal, based on everything I presented to you tonight. But I don't have any data to support that. But what I have data to support is the trapamycin, which we worked a lot on in these early stages, that might prevent risk is a drug that is now going to be tested in the diabetic patients, surgery versus non surgery multi-vessel disease. And I only present to you this data, pointing out that the Sirius trial and the Taxus trial both show that these drugs, in this case, is rapamycin, and rapamycin, and this is taxus here, is significant decrease in stenosis. 
but there are interesting issues. As you can see here in the insulin dependent diabetes, you can see in, uh, actually when you look at these styles that maybe rapamycin is not as good as it is taxes. So our study, which is going to start on January 1st, the Freedom Trial, is a study of multivessel disease and, and, and diabetes, which in fact what we are going to do is bypass surgery against versus not serologous diabetes and any standard is approved. It's going to be used as a five-year study, mortality, non-fatal mind, and it's stored for five years. And what I'm saying to you, we are going to start in January because I've heard today that we are being funded by the NHL design. Two years of work, very hard work to really go through all of this. But I think it's worthwhile because this project is going to attract many other ones to study the role of diabetes in vascular disease. So I'm just finishing by pointing out to you that in each of these circles, I mentioned diabetes as a possibility of enhancing the circles and being very important in the disease that we are talking about, the atherothrombotic disease. Thank you very much.